Hi, Super Ski here. You know, winter's coming. I kind of realized that I spent most of my summer wallowing in my own self-pity. So I want to just enjoy the warmth while we can still have it. I got my nice Hawaiian shirt on, and we're just going to go enjoy the last bit of warmth we can have before it's... Oh my god! It's time for seasonal depression already? Great. Just great. I finally decided I want to go outside, and it looks like destroyed Dick December in the landscape. You know, what am I supposed to do for the next six months? I wonder if I'll ever go. Sure you will, because the lights in the skies are stars. It's not so bad, actually. I can get used to this. You know what? You know what? No. I only have six months to pretend that my chronic depression is only seasonal. You know, it's time to do the impossible, see the invisible, fight the power, and I think I know exactly how to make that possible. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Home Depot for sponsoring this video, and, you know, what I learned is that, as Socrates once said, you can be depressed, but just try to be a robot when you can. <laughs> can't fucking raise my arm higher than <laughs> Yeet! Anyways, uh, we're going to be talking about Gurren Lagann today, uh, it's a show from 2008, so I'm hoping you've seen it by now, it's objectively the best anime of all time. Uh, it's not even an opinion, it's just a fact. Uh, there's going to be a lot of spoilers. Uh, so if you were cool with that, stay around. I don't know. There comes a time in everyone's lives when they figuratively awaken. It might not be something you talk about with others due to a self-imposed decision that nobody can understand you and what you're going through is far different from anything that anyone else has ever experienced. Or, even from a lack of understanding as to how you could even articulate your thoughts and feelings. This awakening is usually brought upon by an existential crisis of sorts. Once you as a person come to terms with the finite limit of life, it becomes the logical conclusion to come as close to infinity as humanly possible within this destined lifespan. Eventually, in this battle, you might even come to terms with the idea that you aren't special, and everyone at some point goes through something similar to this unexplainable and difficult period of life. So what do we do then? I believe that is what Gurren Lagann tries to tell us. I'll expand on the idea of achieving infinity later on, but keep it in your hearts for now. In the meantime, I would like to dissect this show in order to see what it says in the topic. In terms of pacing, I would say that the show is split into three, Maybe 4x if you want to differentiate the Rossiyu arc from the anti-spiral arc. All these stories the show tells us are pillars of life of a generalization depicting what an individual goes through between birth and death. The opening act, which starts in episode 1 and stretches until Kamiya's death, has two major themes. Questioning the status quo and subverting expectations. These are mainstay ideas that are set up and expanded upon further as the show progresses, only becoming more and more powerful as time goes on. Evolving! if you will, which is the biggest theme of the show, but doesn't become quite established until the second act. Now, how old do you think you were before you questioned your parents' decisions? And not just because you wanted McDonald's and they said, no, we have food at home, but finally questioned if your understanding of the world outstripped theirs. I'm sure the age differentiates on a person-to-person -person basis, but this is essentially the mentality that most of our main characters in the first act of Gurren Lagann have. Kamina knows better than the chief, 
and Simone believes that Kamina always knows best. There's a paradise above the roof, one with no walls or ceilings, just a great blue sky. Kamina believes this because he has seen it with his own eyes, but when it comes to Simone, we really don't know what he believes. The story isn't clear with what side he takes in this first episode, and I believe that's done intentionally. Simone is at a crossroads of life where he doesn't know anything. He is unaware if he should obey the authority he always has or start thinking for himself, to use his drill the way everyone wants him to or in order to pierce through heaven. He eventually makes his decision, but is it because he believes it was the right one, or was it made because he just likes the idea of having Kamin as a leader rather than the chief? Simon has yet to separate his own beliefs from authority and is instead deciding who he wants to be ruled by. When they finally escape to the above ground, we see at first glance it is a beautiful environment. However, the reality of this is a hellish landscape where everyone constantly battles for survival quickly sets in. See, as we go from goal to goal, humans have this understanding that the next thing will certainly be better than what is going on right now. People just can't wait to get to the next pillar, whether this is moving from high school to college, from college to your career, or even moving from a relationship to marriage. We all look forward to the next thing, sometimes more than we appreciate our current positions whether we completely understand what the next chapter holds or not. Maybe it's our own personal desire to evolve. The reality of life is that as we advance, each stage is more and more difficult than the last. We always look forward to the future, but fail to see the difficulties the future holds and instead idealize the image of what we believe is to come. More than anything, this chapter shows the development that Simone experiences as a 14-year-old, and it is supposed to mimic what we also experience at this age. We begin to question if age necessarily means wisdom. We understand that reality is a lot more disappointing than we had hoped it to be. We even begin to question the religion we were raised upon. It's at this age that we start to see the limitations that the world places on us, and we start to ask why are they there? Why does it have to be this way? Simon begins to grow and understand his place in the world. He finally starts to grow confidence, and he is finally starting to believe the inspiring words the bro speaks to him, but then... Kamina dies. Without warning, without brace, the light of his world is completely extinguished. And that's life. Tragedy seems to strike at the worst possible time, always when our relative happiness is almost about to peak, just so that the juxtaposition can make it feel incredibly more potent. Now, Simone had already had his parents die when he was young. He has an understanding of death and that life is a precious, finite resource. He even says in his opening scene of the show that eventually the roof will collapse and everyone will die. That's reality. From a young age, he knows that all living creatures are born so that they may eventually die. However, that doesn't make Kamida's death hurt any less. Kamina was everything to Simone. Not only that, but... He was like a monument that seemed deathless. Someone who was so great they couldn't possibly die, and I think some of the viewers felt this way as well, that his plot armor was too strong for the show to kill him off, but the truth of it all is that it doesn't matter how important, magnificent, or infinite you become, you're still going to die. This is the mentality that ushers us in to the second chapter of our story. Believe in the me that believes in you, and believe in the you that believes in yourself are not just empty words of encouragement that should be put on a motivational anime poster you hang up in your bedroom. They represent the two main phases in life where you go from a person that no longer relies on others, but relies on yourself with support from others rather than dependence. This next chapter of the show begins with a lull. A cold Poughkeepsie rain with a gray overcast sky symbolizes the mood of all of our characters at this time. Their newly acquired battleship Daigaren refuses to proceed, similarly to how nobody on the ship is capable of moving on. Simone is taking Kamina's death the hardest and becoming increasingly infuriated at his own inability to emulate his greatest role model. Simone has not only lost his brother, but his will to live, and is constantly throwing himself in dangerous positions in attempts to appear heroic without concern for his own life. It isn't until Nia appears that the situation changes. When Simon frees her from that box in the chasm, her appearance is an immediate sharp contrast to the bland grayness the overall tone of the show has taken. 
She is bright, she is happy, she is warm, and she is soft. The entire world of Gurren Lagann has been designed to appear gruff, tough, and uses a lot of muted color schemes, which makes the prominent use of bright red pop more. Nia just screams the fact that she does not belong immediately, which was great foreshadowing her being royalty from her design alone, but more importantly, her different design hints that she has a different way of thinking as well. Eventually, everyone is capable of more or less moving on from Kamina's death. It still hurts, but progression is important to carry on the will he left behind, and the characters realize that they need to continue to evolve for their own sake and for his. Everyone but Simon, that is. This is symbolized by how the Daigurin begins to move again, while Lagan still refuses to power on for Simon. Now, while I wish Kamina could have met Nia just because I imagine their interactions would have been fantastic, it is ultimately for the best that she arrived after his death. You see, Simon loved Kamina, but he couldn't help feeling like he was living in his massive shadow. Like, people saw him as the inferior Kamina Jr. rather than Simon the Digger. This is even explicitly shown in some of the intermission cards. This plays in his own insecurities that he has to be like Kamina, and even if Kamina wasn't enough, then what does that mean for Simon? He couldn't shake the idea that he needed to step up to the plate and become a person he was not, that is, until he met Nia. Nia was the first thing that exclusively belonged to Simon, and was not shared with Kamina. Not as a possession, of course, but as an experience. Unlike every other character who at this point just saw him as Kamina Jr., she saw him as Simon the Digger, and was capable of appreciating his strengths and talents as a person without comparing him to Kamina. And it was that love and appreciation that made him understand what he needed to grow, which all culminates in the speech he delivers to Guam. My bro is dead. He's gone, but he is right there on my back and here in my heart. He lives on as a part of me, and if you're going to dig, dig to the heavens. Once I've dug through, it means that I've won. Just who the hell do you think I am? I'm Simon. I'm not my bro. I'm me. Simon the Digger. Followed by the absolute poetry of Simon using the Giga Drill break to defeat Guam, which the rest of the team thought only Kamina was capable of. This moment cements Simo's development into becoming the you that believes in yourself. The rest of this chapter focuses on overcoming increasingly difficult obstacles and the evolutions we undergo in order to adapt, ultimately resulting in the overthrowing of the Spiral King Lord Genome, which of course they had to do because Lord Genome was stealing freedom from the individual by placing ceilings over their heads. Now, the show could have used any form of prison to limit humanity's freedom, but they ultimately had Lord Genome place them in underground cities. Why is that? Well, because the sky's the limit, right? Spiral power is only as great as you believe your potential to be. If your potential maxes out at the ceiling above your head, then it isn't too great if you're underground. If you can't overcome the ceilings that limit you in life, you will never threaten those who have broken through those limitations. The only way someone could have defeated Lord Genome is if they were to pierce the heavens, and that's exactly what happened. The defeat of Lord Genome brings us to the time skip, which also marks the next chapter of the show. To me, what the Rossi arc tries to tell you is that life is truly unpredictable, and even when you lose everything and all hope is gone, keep moving forward. Don't stop digging just because you have hit a wall. There's a reason Keaton and Dayaka refer to the moon as a ceiling here, after all. Life is a series of highs and lows. We have to live for the highs and survive the lows. And the further to the extreme each of these waves are, the more sensitive we are to change. Meaning that when things are going good, a minor inconvenience can feel detrimental. And when things are going bad, a small success feels like a major victory. So when things are going great and you hit absolute rock bottom, how is that supposed to feel? Well... That happens to both Simone and Rasiu in this arc. However, they each react very differently. Simone is betrayed by his friends, loses the woman he loves, is responsible for many casualties in life as his battle against the Mugan, and is thrown in prison. Rasiu needs to betray his friends to remedy the cries of the people, needs to figure out how to save the world, and come to terms with the burden of sacrificing hundreds of thousands of lives. They are both in the most stressful and difficult situations of their lives, but their worldviews make them react differently to their hardships. 
What it comes down to is at this point of the show, Simone bases his actions on emotion and values the individual more than anything else. Rossi, on the other hand, bases his actions on logic and values the needs of the many over the needs of the few, which is the exact same mentality of every seeming antagonist of the show. But are they really wrong? The village chiefs, Lord Gnome Rossio, and even the Anti-Spiral fall into what I would describe as good intentions with bad action. What Rossio eventually learns in this arc of the show is one of the biggest morals of Gurren Lagann, and that is that every individual has infinite potential. His development is completely stated in his conversation with Kinon after his arc concludes. I want to know the weight of just one human life. You see, none of the antagonists in this show were necessarily bad guys. They all had good intentions that led them down the wrong path. They were beings that wanted the best possible outcome for the needs of the many. They deciphered their decisions using logic and reasoning, but kicking logic out and doing the impossible is the way Team Daigurin rolls. Doing what is right for all in the face of adversity without limiting others' potential is always the right answer, and that is why Rasu believes he can't hold a candle to Simon. That is until... Simo makes him grit his teeth. Through this, Rossio becomes a balanced act, one that is somewhere in the gray area of the utilitarian antagonists in the constantly evolving Spiral Warriors, which is why he was the best candidate for the leader of Earth when all was said and done. Concluding Rossio's arc leads us into the final battle against the Anti-Spirals, which is hands down the most epic part of the show. Shit just gets turned up to about 13 as they're talking about perceptual teleportation, imaginary space, anti-probability missiles, holes in the space-time. It's like they are just making things up as they go, and the viewer isn't even completely understanding what the characters are talking about half the time. This is intentional completely for two reasons. One is, as we are approaching the peak of the theme of evolution and leading to the reveal of the Spiral Nemesis, the power scaling grows exponentially as we go from Gurren Lagann to Arc Gurren Lagann to Super Galaxy Gurren Lagann to Tekken Tapa Gurren Lagann, even Super Tekken Tapa if we're talking about the movie, which I personally believe is the most powerful thing in all the fiction that has a finite level of strength. Now it not only makes sense for the narrative that Spiral Beings have an infinite exponential potential, but works as a satire for the ridiculousness of power scaling in mecha anime. The second reason things get so crazy in the final act is that it's supposed to be a metaphysical battle happening inside of yourself. More than anything, I believe the anti spirals are supposed to represent your personal demons, your fears, doubts, insecurities, and anxieties. Well, the literal interpretation of what happened was a universal scale battle in order to save every spiral beating from the clutches of oppression. The figurative interpretation is a man fighting against the final pillar of life where you break down your walls and address your own imperfections. It is the hardest battle you will ever face, and most people fail. Hell, most people don't even fight to begin with, but in this fight, as long as you don't give up, as long as you keep moving forward, as long as you kick and scream and fight like hell, you won't lose. Evolve. Adapt. Learn about yourself, and you will see that those dark places of your mind aren't that scary. As you understand yourself and give those insecurities discernible form, you can bring about change in the best possible way. Have you ever noticed how the anti-spirals become more and more human-like as the battle goes on? From an introduction as a faceless energy-based mecha, to having ships that look like body parts, to a strange two-dimensional void man to a three-dimensional creature, the longer the battle goes on, the more they can understand the enemy. It's almost like this battle is just a badass therapy session. Then, just as we think we are winning this battle, something very strange happens. The anti spirals reveal themselves and send everyone into their own personal pocket dimension where their deepest desires are realized. However, in order to halt progression completely, the idea of spiral power is also erased from this heaven. It's like paradise without free will, which is why it is so beautiful when our heroes break out of this trance. We see here that Simone's deepest desire is to be reunited with Kamina. But the version they create for him is one lacking spiral power. Kamina, being a person who is essentially a manifestation of spiral power, is obviously very different without it. Simone is constantly aware that something is missing but can't put his finger on it. That's when the real Kamina shows up. This is without a doubt the best scene in the entire show. 
Kamina was so deeply rooted inside of Simon's heart, his universe, that he could not be erased from his reality. He reminds Simon that his drill will pierce the heavens, and he can't waste time in a fake dream world. Simon then unlocks Nia's box, and the dreamlike state begins to fade away, as if he is finally coming to terms with the past being the past, and what remains to be what is worth living for. And Kamina delivers the line that should be engraved onto everyone's souls. Don't be distracted by the what-ifs, should-haves, and if-onlys. The one thing you decide for yourself, that is the truth of your universe. And with that, Simon's perception of himself reverts back to his current form, and not the child that was constantly living in Kamina's shadow. It's then that they so eloquently state the thing that Simon needed to hear more than anything else. The greatest insecurity of his life, that he would never be as great as his bro, is solved one casual line. Hey, when the hell did you get taller than me? With that, Simon has the courage and the strength to go find the truth of his universe, to leave the past behind, to quit daydreaming on what could have been, and grip destiny with his own hands, just as every one of us should do ourselves. When Nia is rescued and Team Garin transforms into Super Tengen Tapa Garin Lagan, the battle evolves to a universal scale, which rings true to how this battle against everything we hate about ourselves is greater than anything in our conscious reality. Before the final attack commences, Simon declares an evolution of one of the most common catchphrases of the series. Instead of saying, my drill is the drill that will pierce the heavens, my drill is the drill that creates the heavens. This isn't just pandering to sound cool. This is Simon saying, I will create my own heaven right here, a concept that is possible to every single living being if they have the drive to make it true. And as our two forces collide, their Giga Drill simultaneously destroying and recreating the universe, the camera zooms out to reveal that they have become infinite. The peak of all things. The ultimate goal of reality, become as great as possible, has been achieved. However, they aren't done yet. The enemy seemingly breaks down each and every form of Super Tengen, Tapagur, and Lagan until it's reverted back to its original. They are then able to break through until all that is left is Simon in the Anti-Spiral, where they settle things one-on-one. -on -one. A fight for the sake of the universe culminates in a brutal fist fight. This scene is a clear representation of how we must grow emotionally. It isn't by building ourselves up, it's by breaking ourselves down. Destroying the emotional walls we create as coping mechanisms and become vulnerable to the things that forced us to build them in the first place. With that, victory is achieved and the threat has vanished. Following this, we have the controversial ending where Nia dies after her and Simon's wedding. Simon has become so great that he could bring her back to life if he wanted to, but decides not to. He instead passes the core drill onto Gimme and goes off to live his life doing who knows what. A lot of people would say that this defeats the purpose of the entire show, erasing the message entirely, which is to always move forward, to evolve constantly in the face of every adversity, which is just wrong. The message of the show is to reach your own infinity without hindering the progress of others. What I mean by that is to live your life to the absolute fullest without allowing anyone to place a limit or a ceiling on you. To achieve the maximum you can within this finite lifespan. To pierce and create heaven for yourself, but most importantly on this mission, do not put a limitation on others. Now wouldn't bring someone back to life to live according to your own terms and desires be a limitation in itself? I think so, and I'm sure Simon does too. If we all have an infinite amount of time to achieve our own infinity, then desire to evolve becomes obsolete. Simon is happy with the heaven he created for himself. What more could he ask for? So, what does it all mean? Gurren Lagan shows the evolution of human life, and people coming to terms with its finite limit, and their reaction towards reaching infinity. To pierce and create the heavens, if you will, but even so, we all live in an infinitely expanding universe, so the goalposts are constantly moving as to the potential of how great infinity really is. Even if you become the most powerful and influential person on the planet, how small are you in comparison to everything else? The epilogue sums it up best when Simon meets a child trying to use a drill. 
He teaches him the proper technique, and the boy thanks him. He then responds with a series staple of, Of course it worked. Just who in the hell do you think I... Well, I guess I'm nobody. The boy then asks, wondering if he will ever have his turn. Which is returned with the iconic final line of the series. Of course you will. Because all of the lights in the sky are stars. No matter what we do, no matter how great we come, no matter how great we are in comparison to infinity, we cannot achieve it. But we can at least reach for the stars. There is a mathematical law in calculus that states, anything divided by x as the limit approaches infinity is zero. Because even if you have, I don't know, 999 sextillion, it is nothing in comparison to infinity. Our achievements and our greatness are all relative to a concept of infinity that we can't comprehend. No matter how we live our lives, we will eventually be forgotten. Even Simone, who in this show is the most important person who ever lived, has been forgotten by most, and that's okay. Because happiness is not derived from your own greatness. It is about your own personal growth, your evolution and the defeat of your own demons. We all have a drill that we can use to create heaven within our souls. And your mission in life is to find it. We evolve beyond the person we were before. Little by little, we advance with each turn. That's how a drill works. And that is Tengen Tapa. That is Gurren Lagann.